You are listening to The Culture, a podcast on race and politics. The Culture. Hello, I'm Randolph Bracey, and I'd like to welcome you to The Culture, a show where we explore different topics of race and politics. In this episode, we'll look at reparations through the lens of lynching in the United States. I live in Florida, a place that is known for its beautiful beaches, warm weather, and relaxing tourist destinations. Most people don't know that Florida has had the worst record of racial violence and discrimination of any state in this country. Some historians say Florida was the birthplace of the civil rights movement. After the brutal bombing of NAACP pioneer Harry T. Moore on Christmas Day, 1951 in Mims, Florida, the national attention sparked the black movements of the 50s and 60s. But in regards to lynching, Florida has had the most lynchings of any state per capita in the country. As I researched lynchings through the South, and in particular Florida, there seemed to be one common thread. There were blacks who had substantial wealth for that time period. They owned a considerable amount of land and the whites through terrorism sought to take their land. Listen to this account of a massacre that happened a hundred years ago in the city of Okoe, a place where I currently live. The Ku Klux Klan the day before had warned the black folks in Orange County don't y'all think about going to vote now. Not nearly one of you will vote, you hear? Don't stir up no trouble now, they'd say. But there were meetings going on in our neighborhoods quietly and fervently after prayer meetings and Sunday services where people were getting registered to vote. However, as I remember it on election day, just about any black person that went to vote that day was turned away. But a Koi resident, Moses Norman, whose nickname was Mose, decided to seek the counsel of Judge John Cheney. Mose Norman owned a lot of land, and people in our community listened to him. He and Julius Perry, who was known as July, were the main ones registering folk at church. He was operating independently as the go-between amongst the black workers, and the white business folks in the area. Judge Cheney at the time was running for state senate. He convinced Mose in July to register all of us black folks and vote. Judge Cheney promised if he was elected, he would make things better for us. So when election day came, Cheney told Mose to collect all the names of the black folks who weren't allowed to vote and all the names of the white poll workers who didn't let them vote. Cheney said, if you survive, a lawsuit could be filed if they violated anyone's voting right. With this plan in mind, Mose returned to the polls in Okoye, insisting on being able to vote. Those white folks were so mad that Mose had the nerve to tell them he and his people had the right to vote, they mumbled and they grumbled. The Ku Klux Klan started rallying with their white sheets and sent out threats to us in the black community. Soon after, they got their guns and came charging through our neighborhood saying, these niggers need to be taught a lesson. And before you knew it, they had an armed mob looking for Mose and Okoye in our part of town. They were walking right into our homes and taking them over. They were shouting, where's Moses Norman? None of us were saying anything. So they started setting our homes on fire. After a while, they stopped asking where Moses Norman was. They was just setting houses on fire with the people in it. Then I heard somebody shout out from fear, I guess. He's with July Perry. Them white folks all knew where July Perry lived because he owned more land than most of them. They couldn't stand knowing that. And they always kept saying, 
Something needs to be done about them niggas. They own too much. That should be our property. So they marched over to July's land. But I heard July was ready for them. He was the type who didn't scare easy. So when they came after nightfall and kicked in his door, it was said he started firing his shotgun, killing two of those white men right off. While that was going on, folks said Mose Norman ran for his life out the back door and over to warn Reverend Maxwell and his family. Mose took off again, and no one has ever seen or heard of him since. It seemed like the word went out to every white male in Orange County. The mob numbers grew, and their mob leader was the old Orlando police chief, Sam Salisbury. Sadly, I was told that not long before sunrise, the mob lynched July Perry and left his bullet-riddled body hanging in the Orlando city streets on a light pole or on a light post so that everyone could see. And as a warning to anyone who considered resisting as July had done. But the KKK and the mob were not finished. They went back to Okoye in the middle of the night, shooting, killing, and burning anybody with a hint of black in their blood. There were mamas running around carrying their babies as bullets were flying past them. I've learned that one pregnant woman and her mama knowing they would not be able to outrun the mob, just sat in the house as their home burned all around them. Their bodies were found partially burned under the house. Oh, my God, the smoke, the panic, the despair. By morning, after the massacre, there were no colored people left in our section of Okoye. Black folks in other areas were warned to sell or be driven out losing their homes, their possessions, and their property. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. Oh, freedom. After the massacre, the whites that were left in Okoe schemed with the local courts to have the land ownership transferred to them. Over 330 acres of land was stolen that day in 1920. Land worth over $5 million today. But this land taking wasn't an anomaly. Land was a priority for black families after the Civil War when nearly 4 million people were free from slavery. In 1865, just before emancipation, the Union Army General Sherman met with 20 black ministers in Savannah, Georgia, and asked them what they needed. In resounding unison, they claimed that land was what they needed to move on from slavery. General Sherman issued a special order declaring that 400,000 acres formerly held by Confederates be given to African Americans what became known as the promise of 40 acres and a mule. Obviously, the promise never materialized, but near the end of Reconstruction, a new group of black landowners were establishing themselves. Many had experience in the fields, and they, be and they began buying farms and land throughout the South. By 1920, African Americans made up 10% of the population but represented 14% of all Southern landowners. Because of the wealth accumulation in the black community, a white supremacist backlash swelled throughout the South. The terrorism, the violence, the lynchings instituted by poor whites toward blacks during this time period, it wasn't about race, it wasn't about skin color or some arbitrary story of a black man whistling at a white woman that sparked some race riot. The violence was about black wealth.
And that's why I believe that there's a legitimate claim for reparations. Not just for the pain and suffering, the generational trauma, the forced labor with no pay that was inflicted on blacks for hundreds of years, not even for the actual calculable documented wealth theft that was supported by governments and the courts throughout this country. But because I don't believe we can achieve true reconciliation until a wrong is made right. As a state senator, I filed a bill for reparations for the descendants of the Okoe massacre. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this matter. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thank you for listening to The Culture. To lend your views on this topic or other issues of interest to you, please go to RandolphBracy.com or follow at RandolphBracy on all platforms. The Culture.